Uh, hey folks, my name is Mike. Uh, I'm a movement specialist based out of New York City. This is a show where I invite folks like this dude um, to discuss topics, wherever they want. Okay? Joe, oh. would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Joe Gonzalez. Uh, I am also a movement coach based in New York City. Mike Jow is uh, my mentor. So uh, let's, let's just cut right to the chase. Let's get it done. All right, so one of the things that a lot of people who are trainers or movement or weekend uh, gym warriors or whatever, they'll do rows. Like rows is a big part of sure. the culture. It's, it's important for back and, and, and shoulder health. But one of the things that everyone seems to obsess over is the idea of recruiting more lats sure. into rowing. Sure, sure, sure. And knowing, um, given your background and what you've told me, I understand now the relationship between upper and mid trap on a row. Mm -hmm. So perhaps if we could get a more nuanced or detailed explanation as to why we want to favor upper and mid trap involvement mm -hmm. on a, let's say on a one arm dumbbell row, sure. I think that would be awesome and that will lead into my next question. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Um, right, so, so speaking about background, right, like some disclaimers need to be sort of said, right? Hey Jim Platt, how are you doing? Uh, <laughs> I love you. Excellent. Hi Ron, how are you doing? Um, but yeah, hey, so, so much of my uh, professional background or scientific foundation comes from the Postural Restoration Institute. So you can kind of take it as a given that a lot of things I say are referencing or rather my interpretation of, of their work, right? Uh, I could be wrong in my interpretation of it, um, but nevertheless, these are my interpretations of their work. Uh, and the rest of uh, sort of what I know are, are from my self-study of uh, topics like motor control, uh, neuroscience, um, clinical and, and social psychology and psychoanalysis, right? It's, it's how all, all they sort of converge onto, onto each other. Anyways, so back to your question, right? <clears throat> I think, I think um, somewhere along the way in like the annals of like movement science, somebody saw lat as a really powerful muscle, right? Which it is, right? Which it is. Um, but, but I think, uh, at least the way I look at things, um, muscles all serve specific functions, not generalized functions, right? Because you know, at some point we all we all uh, were taught that a sarcomere is a sarcomere, a contraction is a contraction, a muscle is a muscle. No, I mean, tissue-wise, that's obviously true, right? It's a, you know, but it's like a bullet's not a bullet, right? Like a, a hammer is not a hammer. You, you can do different things with it, depends on what what you do with it. So with with respect to muscles, where they are situated and how they're connected and like. Um, what kind of levers they end up having makes all the difference in the world, right? So, you know, your lats, they connect to like a big portion of your spine, right? Big portion of your spine and they attach onto like the erector spinae common tendon, like this, this big tendon, uh, um, like in your, in your pelvic lumbar, lumbar pelvic, whatever, region, right? So it connects to your back of your pelvis and your, your lower back. Um, the other thing is, on the upper extremity, the, it only connects to a tiny, tiny, tiny little part of your humerus. So, like, when people talk about, like, shoulder stabilization requiring lats, that makes no sense. Your lats don't actually, like, connect to your scapula. So how is it going to stabilize your shoulder? Like, I'm baffled. Like, it just doesn't make sense. You can't do that. They just, no. Um, it, you know, so... Because because when when the, it activates, yes, you you produce tension, right? And tension is good, right? No, 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 no. Like tension that is related to the task is good, but like you know, it's like like pulverizing your teeth when you're trying to lift something, dude. You know, like the utility of that is limited. Let's just say, okay, right? So so in terms of like what you're asking, right? Like yes, your lats can you know, extend uh, your humerus or, or like pull your, your arm back. Um, but, but that's happening in a vacuum, right? So, so meaning when that happens, so, so yeah, let, let's just talk about the, the, the arm part of this first, right? So, yeah. so, <laughs> right? so when this pulls back, essentially what it's doing is taking your hum humerus and rotating it this way. In other words, as much as the bottom of the humerus, like the elbow gets pulled back, the top of the humerus gets pulled forward. Right, because something is here, right? Like right, right. there's something that there, there is some kind of resistance or stabilization here. So that's going to end up happening. Um, you know, like then the humeral hair is going to start bumping into the stuff in the front, like ligaments, tendons, muscles in the front, right? Like we, we see a lot of folks that have uh, bicep tendonitis. We see a lot of folks that just have like anterior shoulder pain, like that, that are like unknown in cause, like idiopathic. Um, 
you know, and, and a lot of times these people, when they do anything is less. Right. Right? When they go, when they drop into a hinge, when they go through the descension phase of a hinge, what do they do? They, they, do, they do this, right? For no, re for no reason, right? Because the lat becomes this whole body, general purpose stabilizer. There's no such thing as a general, general purpose stabilizer. Maybe abs, maybe abs, maybe. Okay. <laughs> so, so anyways, right? so, so that doesn't make sense. And the other thing is that uh, whenever you need stabilization, um, when you need stabilization, your, your spine needs to be able to like, stabilize itself in, in like, all directions. Right, so because your your um, lats control or you know, attach to much of your lumbar and some of your thoracic, when this thing contracts, it's gonna push or pull, whatever. It's gonna move the spine forward, mm -hmm. right? In like our POI speak, it's gonna go to extension, right? But <coughs> really, extension, what it is, is is pushing something forward, right? Right, and you like n pretty much no matter what you're doing, if you're pushing your spine forward, you're assisting gravity in pulling you down. Right, because like we got the spine on the back, but like everything in front of the spine is significantly heavier than the spine, right? Because right? you got all this wet shit, right? right. You got all these water bags, right? The like intestinal uh, or internal organs. So when gravity pulls on you, you're gonna go forward. You're not gonna go back, right? right? So if something's going forward, guess what? You're helping gravity. You're not fighting gravity, right? So that costs you that. In addition to like when when you retract, when you retract, whole bunch of stuff goes up at the same time, right? Meaning meaning right, as your clavicle go, goes back, it doesn't, it's not gonna be able to end up just going straight back, it's gonna go up as well, right? It's gonna, it's gonna elevate as well as like going back, right? So in other words, your uh, glenoid is gonna end up facing up, right? So your, your scapula is gonna end up uh, uh, upwardly rotating as you retract. You don't want that downward rotation, right? You don't want that downward rotation, right? So, and, and again, let's give you that. Right, let's give you that. Right, so, so as this this is made to happen, you want that some degree of upward rotation. At least you want upward rotating forces. Traps come in. Right, traps gives you that. Right, traps allows you to access uh, the st stabilization capacity of your thoracic system. Right, because you know if if one side is going back, then automatically it means the other side is going forward. Right, like um, you know, for, for for those of you that are that that have not heard somebody say this. I got a video that I'm not that I'm gonna link in the profile that, that talks a lot about this in terms of like what ribs do, right? And like your your ribs are not designed to do bilateral stuff just because of its connection uh, through the right. thoracic spine. Right. It's just not gonna happen. Like mechanically, there's great limitation to that. So, anyways, so if one side's going back, then that serratus is gonna be eccentrically loaded to pull the the uh, that ipsi, those ipsilateral ribs into ER, which means it's gonna force these guys into IR. So then this actually becomes the stabilizing side, right? Whatever side you're, pu you're pulling, it, it's gaining stabilization from the opposite side with this compression, right? IR is compression here, right? right. So, so you need a local anchoring strategy. LATS is requiring you to get anchor, get support from like someplace else, like from the next day over, right? Uh, it, it's inherently gonna cause just way more work than necessary. Right, whereas traps allows the kinetic energy, both potential and you know actual kinetic energy, to stay in the negative. Right, so that it, it then it then just flows from one side to the other side, forward and backwards, um, and not to mention it allows you to actually compress the spine in a, in the way that spines need to be compressed in order to stabilize. Right, because otherwise you're pushing things forward. Right, and you know I guess in the seventies and eighties and nineties that's okay because we didn't know any better, but like. Because uh, like Ron didn't do this thing um, yet. Thanks, but, Ron. Yeah, it's your fault. Um, <laughs> right. But anyways, um, so so um, you know this strategy allows you to regulate the pressure. This strategy, being a non lat centric strategy, allows you to compress and regulate the pressure of your two cavities. Otherwise, it all goes out the window, yeah. right? Um, but yeah, I think that's the like mechanical stuff I want to talk about. Th does that does that make sense? That makes sense. Uh, now I have two other questions yeah. as a result of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the first question would be, as a thought experiment, what would happen if we were to favor downward rotation on a scapula when performing, let's say, a dumbbell row? Just for the purpose of saying, like, <clears throat> this all sounds well and good in what you're saying, but maybe someone that hasn't been initiated or hasn't been exposed to some of these concepts, they're like, 
I, I don't believe you because why would I want to shrug up to retract? Sure. You know, that's a very common thing is like saying, Absolutely. like someone, a very beginner would say, uh, or even an intermediate lifter would be like, hey, that's that's not right. Wait, like, wait, I wait. know that's not right because so-and-so said such. Sure, 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 sure. So as wait. a counter to what you just Absolutely. said, yeah. uh, how what, what would be some of the implications of downward rotation sure. or depression sure. of sure. that scapula while undergoing a rub? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, you know, when that happens, like, all your downward rotators are not very good at stabilizing this region, like the shoulder girdle and the shoulder joint, right? So, so the shoulder girdle is just, like, scapula and clavicle. Mm. Right, some some people even define shoulder girdle of just uh, a scapula, right? And the shoulder joint is the joint formed between uh, your shoulder blade, your scapula, slash the glenoid, and the humerus. Right, shoulder joint, shoulder girdle, different things, right? For you to stabilize the motion of this guy, doesn't matter where we're going, right? You need stuff that holds onto the uh, scapula. Right, exactly. You see where I'm going with this, right? So, yeah. so your most powerful downward rotator or depressor is the lat. Again, it doesn't connect to the shoulder blade. So, so now you have this thing that you're trying to move that has no anchor yeah. other than ligaments and, and like passive soft tissue. Dude, you go down that route, you're going you're gonna to run into a whole bunch of different problems, not just mechanical, okay? Um, but yeah, so, so and, and your other like downward rotator is rhomboids, right? They're not that big. One, one, they're not that big. Two, like they only pull in one direction, right? Which is like this. Like if, if you know, we're looking at the, the this, 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 this is the scapula from the behind, this is the forward, right? like they only do this, right? right? They only do this. And the, the beautiful thing about traps is that uh, they have a massive, massive attachment to uh, cervical and, and thoracic spine and upper trap holds onto the clavicle as well. Right? Clavicle, I think of the clavicle as a crane that holds onto the scapula. So if you want to move this, right? That's all fine and dandy. But you need to make sure that this joint, the AC joint, is well protected, right? Again, when I say protected, I mean some active tissue, right? Some active tissue, a tendon or a muscle, needs to be able to work or do whatever to ensure that this relationship gets maintained, right? So that you don't put like passive structure under load, right? Um, but yeah, so that right, it's very very convenient that way yeah, yeah. in terms of like what la what traps give you. <laughs> All right, what traps give you? And again, if you're rowing, mm -hmm. if you're rowing, you're fighting against gravity. Right. So something's gotta go up. S something has to, like, something's gotta go up. Why would you help gravity fuck you up? Right. They do that well enough already. Right. Right. But like that, that's that's my take on like why would you not do this? Because life is about this. Right. Some somehow. Right. Like that's a, that's a different discussion. But yeah. Um, right. Yeah, that, that's that's what Very I, was, nice. I would say. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really important to highlight that because yeah. sometimes you can give a good explanation for why something is or why we do something, yeah. but then someone just needs to hear the counter argument because Absolutely. that's what someone's gonna 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 offer up as as uh, as an argument. Mm -hmm. Well, what about this or what about this? And it's yeah. like you're saying the same thing that you just said in the previous part, but now you're just clarifying it. Yeah. In more uh, from more approaches. For sure. For sure, for sure, for sure. Having said that, uh -huh. now I have another question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So now we have this mechanic of retraction and a little bit of upper rotation to go through uh, a rowing mechanism. Sure, 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 sure. You talked about shoulder and uh, scapular stabilization. Sure. And opposition of the opposite internal obliques to give us that to give us that stability. So when we're pressing overhead, mm -hmm. now it's a slightly different mechanic. It's a very different mechanic. Is would it, you mind going yeah. into that just a little bit? Like it's the same and different mechanic, right? It's very, very interesting. Uh, it's very, very interesting because <clears throat> for for the uh, shoulder blade to, to to upwardly rotate, right? To upwardly rotate, it, it actually requires a very interesting confluence of forces, right? So so you can Google this, right? Like, you just like Google scapular upper rotation, and like you look uh, go go to the uh, image tab of the results, and you you will see this diagram. Where it's a scap, and then it's got like an arrow pointing this way, arrow pointing this way, and arrow pointing this way, right? Uh, and so, so if this is your scap, this is the right scap facing this way, right? Meaning chest is here, back is here, and then your skin's here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? Um, and so, so what we should probably do with this? Okay. <laughs> do you want me to just like turn around so you can use my no, 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 no. <laughs> right, so. So uh, mid trap is gonna is gonna attach like this, right? Mind you, uh, upper trap has barely any attachment on like the scapula itself is mostly connected to the clavicle, right? So mid trap's gonna pull here, which means when it yanks, 
it's gonna it's gonna do this, right? It's gonna yank this way. Like lower traps like this, it's also gonna yank this way, right? And you got serratus on this side. Like mind you, yeah. if you look at what the serratus looks like, the top fibers are a lot shorter than the bottom fibers, which means if they all yank at the same time, which a muscle generally would, uh, you're gonna do this, right? Because you're gonna have a lot more moment down here than here, which means you're essentially doing this, if I were to exaggerate the forces, because like it's a lot less and just a little bit of this. Again, all these three comes together to do this, right? So, so you know, for a lot of people that, that struggle with like shoulder stabilization, both traps and serratus are hard to find, okay? Both of them are hard to find, but for upper rotation, traps will give you a lot more. Traps will, will give you a lot more. Much of it because their line of pull is exactly perpendicular to the direction that you're trying to go. Yeah, so, so they are worth more money, if you will, right? Like, this ain't worthless, but the traps are worth more money, right? So that's why, that's why for, for upper rotation, it's so important to, like, retract low. You, you will feel traps load, and then they sort of take over, right? So the other thing is, for upper rotation, for, for, any, for anything where you involve the, the uh, arm, the, the humerus going this direction, deltoids are involved, right? Deltoids are involved. Mm -hmm. so, because your deltoid is attached to uh, uh, your scapula, again, a muscle, if you, if you just talk to one, this one muscle and all the motor units in, involved in it, they, all they're gonna do is this. Right. They don't know what's going on, they don't, they don't know that you have life, they don't care about you, <laughs> they, they're just gonna do this, right? So, in other words, um, in the vacuum, in the vacuum of space, the deltoid will pull the humerus this way just as much as it's gonna pull the scapula this way. And and um, if you look up if you look up uh, um, um, scapular humeral rhythm in this book called the kinesiology of musculoskeletal system by Donald Newman, uh, they they actually have a really good expose on this thing. Uh, in that when people don't have traps, when folks don't have traps, um, they over rely on deltoids. And what ends up happening is. It, during the effort of doing this, they actually downward rotate, downwardly rotate the scapula, right? Wow. Right. So this this can't go up anymore. Right. Right. right because right. right, there's no anchor. There's no anchor for this to go up. This got to be stable, right? Traps, traps will will, will provide excellent counter force force for that. Wow. Right. So it anchors the deltor so that deltor can pull only this rather than both. You pull both, nothing is going to happen. Right. Uh, but yeah. So. So, so that's why you, you really need traps for upper rotation and, wow. and like overhead activities. That makes a lot of sense, especially yeah. if you hear that a lot of coaches and a lot of people that have been in the industry for a long time mm -hmm. will uh, favor lats right. for overhead pressing. Right. And then you're still seeing a lot of shoulder issues, a lot of impingement issues, Absolutely. a lot of just like uh, wear and tear yeah. from a mismanaged scapula. Right, because it, it, it's interesting you bring in that point, right? Because you know, if we break this down, and, and those of you who are, who are getting into this, uh, like in, in getting into this conversation, feel free to pull up like a, a anatomy atlas and just take a look at like, and, and make sure you're tracking where all these things are because things are about to get interesting here in a little bit. Complete anatomy actually is a really good app if you want to just flip through that too. Yeah, those guys are awesome. Uh, but anyways, so if you, if you use lat, right? Again, mind you, lats don't connect to scapula, right? So the humor is being pulled down. So now, since you're moving a humerus up, your deltoid will have to wake, work way harder against a massive lat. Like, lat is most of your back. That's why bodybuilders love that shit, because it makes you look awesome from the back. Also means this is a massive thing this little muscle has to work against. So what's gonna end up happening? Now, you have a stable humerus. You have a humerus that is more stable than the scapula. You're just gonna end up pulling the scapula downward because of what lat's doing, again. Humerus is stabilized, right? right. Kinematically, it's not, because be, being allowed to move. Kinetically, I mean, meaning forces-wise, going, like, there's a lot of forces providing opposing stabilization, oppositional stabilization against deltoid's action on the humerus. Like, it's being pulled down while deltoid's trying to pull it up. Right. Well, a lot less of that's gonna happen, and a lot more of this action of this uh, shoulder blade is gonna happen. You're gonna have problems. At first, you might not, as a young dude, you know, in your twenties, thirties, maybe, depending on your genetics. Eventually, you pay the price. Like we've seen, we've seen so many people that yeah, that's like that, right? Absolutely. And then traps ends up being like 
a great, hilarious source of cramping when they learn about it, right? And then it changes everything, right? Yeah. That's cool. That's yeah. very awesome. Uh, going over, oh, the one thing I wanted you to touch on a little bit too was yeah. uh, the opposition for obliques. Sure. Ipsilateral obliques for that same press. Yeah. That is also a slightly different mechanic as well. Absolutely. Because the, 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 the movement, the, the actual translation of the shoulder blade is very similar on, let's say, a dumbbell row and a press, which I thought when, when, when I first heard that, when you first taught it to me, I was like, oh my God, that's insane. Right. But it makes sense since with everything else, like your, your lunge, your deadlift, everything else is mirroring similar positions. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. why wouldn't this extend towards upper body management? Sure. So sure. just uh, ipsilateral obliques for an overhead press as opposed to the relationship on a dumbbell row. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, because... Um, you know, the way we gotta think about this is, <coughs> if something's going some in in a certain direction, mm -hmm. the more forces are being projected towards that direction, wherever that direction may be, its origin must be just as stable, mm -hmm. right? No, no, it's, it's no shit like how how weapons work, right? Like like the heavier the round, the the better the stock must be, and the more stable your shoulders gotta be, right? So because that initial force is gonna go real far, right? It's exactly the same thing here. Here's what I mean, right? So if you're going up this way, then it's going to be much more difficult to funnel those forces to the opposite side. It's just much easier to deal with that shit right here, right? So the more stabilization you have, the more compression you have, the more you can you can deal with and dampen the reaction forces. The ground ground is not the only thing that gives you reaction forces, right? right? So so as you go up. Right, as you, I mean, it's like, it's like what we were talking about just now, right? As, right? as this goes up, these deltoids, they're loading the crap out of this humerus. Right? Right, Again, right. like, you know, most of our muscles, they are not, they don't have a lot of uh, mechanical advantage, right? Uh, in that their leverage isn't great. Right. Because, so, so that it opens up for, for just great wide range of control, right? So they generally have to work really hard, they j per capita. Right, they generally have to work really hard, so that means they need a really strong anchor point. Right. So for this to like, you know, be anchored and be stable, this gotta come in, right? Because, yeah, no, it's it's nice that like mid trap and lower trap are are upwardly rotating, but straighters they are doing that too, like a lot, right? Because straighters needs to enable to, needs to be able to, um, manage forces of traps in the other plane. Here's what I mean. Traps, the way we're talking about traps now, we're pretending as if traps only do this, right? But they also retract you, right? So uh, they also retract you. So that means if not regulated, right? If not regulated, um, they're gonna take, they're gonna take the uh, scapula and do this with it, right? They're, they're gonna do that with it, which you know, it, it, that's not a bad thing or anything, right? Um, that's not a bad thing, or anything, but when straight is, uh, kicks on, it's it's going to help you regulate that, right? Because traps pulls you back, straight is also pulls you forward. So wh when you have those two forces opposing each other, then the only way, the only place all these forces are gonna go, meaning mid trap, low trap, straight is put together, is this. Right, it makes it much, much cleaner. Now you're opposing each other, meaning traps and serratus are opposing each other to clean up force vectors, mm. right? Rather than going both planes, mm, okay. right? So, so when that happens, when that happens, again, muscles are dumb, right? So when this happens, it's also going to pull the uh, uh, grip cage into internal rotation, in compressing it, right? So now you inherently have a really stable base down here. In order to do this shit with, got right? it, got right. it. Because usually, lo oh, not usually, but you know, a lot of times when people, when people do these difficult, awkward, compromised uh, activities, their motor planning process gets stuck in a certain part of the brain, mm -hmm. right? So, so you you have like, the brain is broke broken up into like threes. Okay, for some reason, evolution really likes threes. Okay, so so your your tertiary uh, motor area, which is where um, the the first stages of planning happens is prefrontal cortex, right? Your frontal lobe somewhere, prefrontal cortex, right? And then your secondary motor area is is the next step in the in the planning, right? 
right here, right between primary and, and, and tertiary. Right? And your tertiary motor area, um, other than executive functions of like daily life and decisions and things like that, with respect to motor, they imbue a motor pattern with meaning, with purpose. Like, why are you doing this? You know, it's like, no one's gonna like, no one's ever just gonna do this for no reason, right? right. Even this is for the reason of demonstration. You know what I'm saying? Like, with no reason, nobody's gonna do that, right? Generally, when people do this, is they're picking up a cup to like, I don't know, drink and splash them with water or some shit, right? So, so the purpose of that comes from here, right? And then the next part of the brain, the, the secondary motor area, it is primarily concerned with directionality, just directions, what direction things are going, right? So this part of the brain is where a lot of people mess, mess up or, or where a lot of people's prediction models needs or motor patterns, uh, needs refinement because um, if they over-reference something, then the direction that something needs to go becomes the direction that everything's gotta go. Here's what I mean, right? So when you go overhead, like this gotta go forward and up, right? Mm. <clears throat> right forward is up, right? This, right? So then, you know, we see this all the time. I'm sure my, my colleagues out there, you know, watching this, you see this all the time too. When people go overhead, what happens to the chest? This, right? See, the chest is now matching what the arm is doing. They're stuck at that secondary step of motor planning. In reality, this is the only thing that's going on. Everything else actually has to do their own separate jobs, right? This needs to just compress, actually technically go in the opposite direction, right? This is going this way so that this can go this way, right? right, right, right. right. For completely different reasons, right? So if you can set up those reasons and, and your subconscious motor, motor centers can, can recognize that this is required, it becomes much cleaner, right? Because if everybody's trying to go up, who's anchoring it? Right. But you're gonna ground them, right? <coughs> right? Like in PRI, uh, in, in the classes, you know, like oftentimes we're taught to to essentially bring the ground up, like make ground in places. Right, right, right. You're gonna ground if you, if all this goes, like the highest place on your body. Like if you do this, the highest highest place on your body that you can possibly have ground is like the knee, right? You throw the pelvis out. There's no pelvis, right? Because the pelvis is not pelvis if you can't stabilize this, right? Mm -hmm. Like, for some people, the reason why they get cat is so that they can kill mice, right? If you don't kill mice, you can cat. In that context, it's terrible. <laughs> uh, but anyways, right? So if your pelvis can't stabilize this, it, it ain't pelvis. If, you, if your spine can't transmit forces up and down, it's not spine. If, you, if your femurs can't stabilize the pelvis, it's not femur, right? Your knee don't got to do a whole lot. It's just, just stay put and shut the fuck up, right? So, so <laughs> at that point, all you got is knee. You, you don't have a body, right? And, and that is more true for some people than others. Yeah. yeah, you messed up. Okay, you messed up. Now, okay, big time. Okay, do you want to know how you messed up? Yes. All right. So I don't think you've ever talked about this in any of your other videos. You remember? Right. But you just mentioned prediction models. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you've inundated me with this information for the last three years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But for everyone else watching this, would you care to go into a little bit of what prediction models are? Sure, sure, sure. And what the fuck do they have to do with? lifting and other endeavors in the gym or life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, so I think, um, I think prediction model is one of those things that, um, that is kind of experiencing a renaissance in like the cognitive sciences. I'm talking about like, uh, you know, psychoanalysis, psychology, neuroscience, and co cognitive sciences. Um, and, and it's slowly making, a, making its way into like the movement sciences. Um, but essentially what happens is, all your experiences are predicted. There's, there's no such thing as real-time experiences. Human beings are all mammals. Uh, just generally, life on Earth. Do not experience life um, in real time. Because, I mean, I understand what you might be thinking, right? If I touch this table, I'm, touch, I'm sensing the table the moment that, uh, that I touch the table. Uh, that's not because of mechanical receptors sending back information instantaneously. They may be very fast. Even the speed of light is not instantaneous. Right? And there's nothing on your body that's moving nearly <laughs> at the speed of light. I promise you that shit. Okay, so how are you experiencing this then? Okay, so um, these files are stored in various appropriate places in the, in the neocortex, within the neocortex, right? So you have your uh, sensory areas, essentially the back half of the brain for somatic sensory, for auditory, for visual. And then for spatial, right? So you have these things called association area. Google that stuff, it's, it's you know, all there, <laughs> right? So you have these, these association areas 
um, that converge all these different sensory modalities, meaning visual, auditory, uh, somatosensory, vestibular, they all get converged into this, this area, about, about roughly here in this neighborhood, right in your parietal lobe. Um, and they, you have other association areas, I'm just talking about this one for now, okay? Uh, <laughs> the, and all of your spatial information are there in four dimensions, right? When I say four dimensions, I'm talking about like, like X, Y, and Z and then time, okay? Just four dimensions of sensory information, okay? Meaning auditory, that's one dimension, visual, that's one dimension, somatic sensory, that's one dimension, and vestibular, that's one dimension. That, these are four dimensions, like they just converge. It's like four lines converge, okay? So within that space, it's almost like a landscape, okay? Just bear with me a little bit. It's almost like a landscape, and on this landscape are infinite points of space, of spatial relationship you have ever encountered in your whole life, okay? And, and then when you, when you think about something, when you're about to do something, this part of the brain called, called the cerebellum does the pre prediction, it crunches the numbers, okay? It's, it's supposed to be crunches the numbers, it tries to figure out what's gonna happen. So, so touch the, 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 the act of touching the table, it, goes like, it kind of goes like this. Um, you decide that you're gonna touch a table. Okay, you've decided up here you're gonna to touch a table. And that message immediately gets sent to uh, the cerebellum. The cerebellum, or rather, the connection between the neocortex and the cerebellum uh, is more numerous than the connection within the uh, neocortex. This is a heavy, heavy traffic area, okay, for this reason. All right, so you decide you're gonna do that, and message gets sent to the cerebellum, hey, what's gonna happen, right? And the cerebellum crunches the numbers, right, so that by the time you touch this, the cerebellum would have given you a virtual experience of touching the wood. And then the moment your mechanical receptors on your finger actually get activated, it takes about like 100 milliseconds or so for this message to get sent to the brain. So th that would have been a delay, right? And, and you know, I promise you, in a fight, that's already too fucking late. You're, you're gone, right? Uh, anyways. Right, meaning, like, think about it. Right? If everything you do has at least a hundred millisecond delay, man, the, you know, something, something big and hungry is going to eat you. <laughs> right? So, so, and again, this is a hundred milliseconds to get to the brain. Never mind processing. Okay. So, so, this forward prediction model gives you the sensation, and then what you end up actually <coughs> uh, uh, receiving uh, gets gets superimposed over your prediction model for accuracy. So, any dis discrepancy is going to be updated. Right? So, and that's what learning is. Right? So, so when you do anything, there's a prediction model involved. Right? And, and whenever you do something wrong or you fail <coughs> to do something the way you expect it to be done, there's a discrepancy between your prediction model and your behavior. Okay? Yeah, this, this is a massive fucking topic. Right? Yeah. Um, this, yeah, you messed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like saying, like, oh, no, I got to bring it up. Yeah, I got to yeah, bring it up. Yeah, you it's, can't not it's, do it. It's a huge topic that's undergoing furious research across all fields in like cognitive sciences. It's, we're living in some, in some exciting, exciting times, like just the concept of like prediction model and, and its molecular and uh, neurochemical behavior and mechanisms allows us to explain so many really fascinating things. Um, but yeah, so, so prediction models in everything. In fact, the cerebellum has a prediction model for the new cortex. Like this thing is like, yeah, this thing is magical. Okay, this thing's magical. So anyways, right, so, so when, we, when we do things, different constructs gets predicted, right? The construct of this, its function, its morphology, it's all these things gets, gets constructed. And again, the mechanism of your prediction models are outside of your conscious, right? It's in your unconscious, right? Like, again, because you can't just think about your cerebral, okay? It just gets done for you. It's like, for those of you that drive, Neither of us drives. Uh, for those who <laughs> New uh, you, you that drive, um, at this point, if you if you're adult, you're watching this. If you're a teenager, why are you watching this? Anyways, keep uh, watching that. <laughs> as, a, as an adult, when you're driving, you don't you don't know like how many degrees you're you're turning, how how much you're pressing on the gas or whatever. But your second day ever learning to drive, you're watching these things like a hawk, right? Because you you're probably gonna die, right? you know. <laughs> but anyways. Right. At this point, you're not thinking about that anymore. Your prediction models have taken that over. In fact, unless you think about it, you can't really access that information, meaning how much you're turning, how much you're pressing. You, you don't think about that. 
because these behaviors are outside of your conscious, right? Um, but yeah, so so these are relative, actually, you know, relatively complex uh, micro or sub behaviors are very well managed, locked away in a filing cabinet, um, you know, to be brought out whenever it needs to, right? So so back to this, right? Mm -hmm. So if your prediction model only has up, right, which is right. only has up, something else is gonna have to like pay for that, right? right. But if you pay up front <coughs> and, and you end up doing what you need to do, meaning your prediction model involves what needs to be involved in order for this to be sustainable, then once you build it, you don't have to think about it anymore. Right. But yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hey folks, this is somehow part two now. Okay. Okay. All right, go ahead. All right, cool. So uh, building off of that, if we look at, let's say an overhead press, right? And we have to maintain this position of ribs stacked over a pelvis, great. Uh, for a lot of people, however, based on their experiences or how they've been taught how to do this move, it becomes a global extension pattern. Um, so would it be safe to say that in order for them to be able to utilize these prediction models, they would have to consistently update their definitions for one, what they're experiencing, two, what constitutes a press, a, an efficient press overhead, um, and they have to keep updating this library, the semantic definitions of what they're doing in order for them to improve their movement or update their prediction models. Could you go a little bit into like how necessary it is to develop and define more constraints? Sure. So, you know, th this question I think I think begets like two parts, <laughs> right? Because one one thing you, you asked was was um, you know their definition of how they're experiencing this, right, or something along those lines. Yeah. Right, and then, and then secondly, their definition of what their movement is, right? So the experiencing of it, that's where I think people run into real trouble, mm -hmm. right? Because the second part's actually easy, mm -hmm. right? Like, like clinically, we see this a lot, right? right. Like, you know, um, a lot of people that have no problem sensing themselves accurately, once you just go over the technique, you, once you convey the technique properly, conveying, you know, with the assumption that they understood it, uh, right, then you know it's it's very smooth ride, right. right? But most people that find this are not do they do not live in this camp. They live in this camp, right? Uh, that their foundational issue, that the whole really reason why they deal with some of the things that they deal with is because they cannot sense accurately, yeah. right? They may even know what to do, right? It's like once we work with them, it's like we explain some things many times, right. and you know it's like <coughs> you, we get the sense that if somebody else was standing in front of them, they could teach it moderately well. Right, right. But they can't do it because of this, right? right? So, this really lives in, in uh, a part of our memory systems um, called implicit memory system, right? So, um, implicit um, is named as such because you can't um, consciously access it, mm. right? This is also called non-declarative memory, okay. right? So this is where skills live, okay. right? This is where skills live. But this is also where sensory definitions live. Here's what I mean, right? Yeah, she's looking real. <laughs> so if you put your hand uh, on a surface of any kind, for right. me and you, the, this, this table, actually this table is a really good uh, uh, um, example of this, right? It's not uniform in shape, right? This right. is like hot, real wood, it looks like. Yeah, it's right, there's like, the, the, right, exactly, there's, there's unevenness all over the place. So when you when you uh, touch it, especially with something like a thumb, right? Um, you know, across your thumb, a lot of different things come through. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is, first, the hardness of it, like how stiff the surface is, right? right? How smooth it is, right? How coarse, how smooth it is, how much, how many gaps there are between like molecules and stuff like that, right? right? Um, or, or at least your perception of that, right? right? Um, the angle of it, like, is it flat to the ground? Right? Is it parallel to the ground? Right? right? How the, the flatness of it, the temperature of it, right? all these things, right? So, you know, this is what neuroscience would call the perception level, right? Meaning there's meaning. Mm -hmm. This is not sens sensation, this is perception, right? Sensation has no meaning. Sensation is just what kind of mechanical uh, signals are being triggered by your mechanical receptors, right? right. And therefore, meaning you have, a, you have mechanical receptors for temperature, you have mechanical receptors for pressure, mm -hmm. right, because you detect the shape and hardness of things based on pressure, right, right? because 
if you don't press down onto it at all and you really just barely touch it, you're not going to detect a whole lot, right? right? Okay. And then the differentiation between all these things. So, you know, like, as you're touching something like this, okay, there's the hardness of it. What is, what makes up, what kind of sensory information makes up the hardness? Mm -hmm. Right, you can't, you can't access that. Right, right. Right, like, right. right, for those of you watching, literally do this, right, put your hand on something, right, and, right, you, you can feel how hard it is, but what's, what makes up that sensation? It's gotta be something. Right. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sensing that. But what is that? You can't access that. <laughs> that, that is in memory science or cognitive psychology. Um, this is called sensory priming. Mm -hmm. Meaning, your nervous system has to give these collection of mechanical signals a meaning. Right? This, whatever this collection of, you know, like thousands of mechanical signals come together to mean hard or this hard, right? So, and of course, it's throughout development, this has to be like set, like this, these definitions, these neurological definitions need to be set, right? That this experience comes from whatever, 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 right? So, and of course, you know, like there is some degree of, of, of you know, attention to detail, lack of a better term. Like uh, there's a degree of detail that comes with that, meaning, meaning your ability to differentiate finer and finer and finer things, mm. right? Like, so if if you have if in your whole life you've only experienced two solid objects, one being a steel ball, right? Another being marshmallow, right? They are very different from one another. If you put them together, it's very easy to tell them apart. Right. Right. That doesn't require a lot of sensitivity. Right. Right. But if you start adding things between these two, mm -hmm. you know, that qualitatively between these two things, you're going to develop, you will then develop more and more granularity mm -hmm. in your ability to sense things, will become more accurate. So a lot of this comes down to exposure. Most of it comes down to exposure. Because, well, let me, let, let's, let's, take that example uh, another direction, right? So if indeed steel ball and marshmallow is all you have ever experienced, there's no way you can conjure up more, more accuracy. Right. Right? Doesn't happen. Because, and, and from an evolutionary standpoint, like if that's your environment, right? Let's just say somehow you live on a fucking planet where there's just, just these two things. Right. Why would you ever spend or waste the extra neurological bandwidth to, you know, be aware of something else? Right. That bandwidth could be used for other things. Right. But anyways, right, so again, this is about our mapping of reality. Ooh, yeah. that, that has a lot of implications this across the board. Across Cause, everything. Because now, like, and you know where, where my mind tends to go with yeah. a lot of this stuff. It's like, now we're going to go with tangents. We're going to come back to this. Yeah, we're yeah. going to come back to this. But now, that's we're, you're just talking about sensory awareness from a perspective of tactile. Mm -hmm. Interaction. Right, exactly. We're not talking spatial. Nope. We're not talking visual. We're right. not talking uh, relationships. Right. Because this stuff permeates through Everything. all of our experiential. Right. Absolutely. This mechanism. This mechanism is across everything. So, because now this is the kind of stuff that you're digging into a little bit more, and I'm sure. I'm really interested in a lot. Sure. If you are only exposed to um, a passive aggressive. Parent, sure, sure. And maybe uh, a disassociative or a person who just isn't able to communicate or connect. Sure. Um, I may be using that term inc improperly, right, but right. you get the idea of what I'm trying to say. Right, these, right. these are your models right. as parental figures. Right. So then this is how you learn to interact with your environment, with your classmates, with your teachers. And now because that's these are the people that are imprinting these kind of behaviors into you because these are the experiences that you're defining. These are your marshmallow and your and your steel ball. Steel ball. Yep. Then that just has ramifications for that's how you view everything. Yes. And you don't even know that that's how you're viewing these things. Why? So you can't reference something else when something else Precisely. interacts with you that you don't recognize. It's foreign, right. and that triggers fear because now you can't predict uh, what's going on. Absolutely. Oh, that's. That's trippy. Right, and and I'll just add that there's actually, it, it, it gets worse or better, whatever. <laughs> um, 
Uh, and folks, these little tangents, this is why it's on a video format, right? You can like rewind to like make sure you're on the same page or whatever, right? <laughs> so, um, so, because some, some people that are not familiar with these concepts uh, uh, may be thinking, you know, it's like, well, so what? Why can't you think outside of this, right? Y y exactly. It's like, you know, those of us has, who have done like the internal work with a good therapist, it's like, right, right. No, it ain't that simple. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. like, but until then, you're like, well, I can obviously do all of this. It's like, if I can't do that, it's obviously my fault. I just need to work within myself harder, right? Right. Right. So, yeah, exactly. So, so it's like, you know, again, if your reality is just made up of a steel ball and marshmallow, you wouldn't even think that something, a third thing, a fourth thing, or whatever, is possible. Right. You, why would you think that? Right. You know? Right. It's the same thing with, like, you know, the onset of, of like, racial tension between, you know, two cultures, right? If this culture have only ever seen their own kind, you know, like yeah. without interaction with other cultures, you would never think other cultures even exist. Right. Right. Like in America, that's kind of rare, but in like other older cultures, yeah. you, a kid grows up thinking that's all there is. I mean, that's less and less true these days with like international TV and shit like that, whatever. But nevertheless, it still holds true, right? Like as a child, as a as an infant child, pre-verbal experience, pre-verbal experience precludes time. Okay. Right. In that, before the onset of language in your experience, eternity is all you have. You lack the tool, i.e., language, to chop up experience based on a chronological or temporal means. And just to clarify sure. this, because when you say nonverbal, are you, I'm not even, I'm thinking not even speech, like words. No. I'm thinking like grunting sounds and oh, no, no, no. from, that, or, that, that counts as nonverbal. Correct. Okay, so the actual language. Correct. Pre -language. Words and stuff, so pre-language, okay. Because pre I was thinking it was like, even about like, oh, damn, that's, I mean, when you pop out of the womb, so when you're basically still in here, like that's how I that's how I picture. Oh, that it. includes it too, right? Because that includes it too. But nevertheless, uh, that means that means if you don't see it, it doesn't exist, right? And if you do see it, it exists forever, oh. right? Okay. Right. Right. Because the mind has no ability to hold on to anything. So since you can't hold on to it, it cannot be lost. Therefore, whatever you see lasts forever. In the mind of an infant. Oh God. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. So now the first thing that comes to mind is like when you play peekaboo with a baby. Yeah, that's exactly what. <laughs> that's exactly what. <laughs> the oh. moment you go like this to a baby, you're not just gone. You're gone forever. You stop existing. That's why the baby just like freaks out. Where did you go? Right. You don't exist anymore. And then all of a sudden, you, out of nowhere, it exists again. Because think about it, right? Like it's, they don't know about the differentiation between seeing and knowing. Seeing is knowing. Right. You don't, the, whatever you don't see, you don't know of. When does that switch happen? When do like, is, is it language essentially when they start talking or is it? That's a fucking question. So, <laughs> so, so glad we have this here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, it doesn't stop with language. Okay. It, the, it grows a bit exponentially with language, but mm -hmm. it doesn't start with language. It starts when the baby realizes mm -hmm. the adults that it interacts with mm -hmm. are their own people. Because initially, initially, the infant manipulates reality. Mm -hmm. uh, let me define manipulation, right? I'm not talking about like getting somebody to do something, you know, at their cost for your benefit. Like, this is manipulation. You know what I'm saying? Like, right like right. so, so you you are changing reality, right? You're changing reality, mm -hmm. right? It's like if you, I changed reality just now. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not talking about like Thanos changing reality. I'm talking <laughs> about like your perception, perceptual, subjective reality, being different now, mm -hmm. right? So. That's what I mean by manipulation, right? So, 
the infant manipulates reality based on its connection or his connection or whatever to the mother. Okay. Right? Because if he if the infant cries, he or she cries, mom's gonna come over, right? So that becomes a benign mechanism of control. Good mom comes over. Good, well, I mean yeah, we are talking about just normative, right? <laughs> but yeah, like comes over right. for whatever. Right. So so now the mom becomes a tool. Mm -hmm. by, by necessity, you right. should, right? right? Like, honestly, if you don't think that way, you might want to talk to some people. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, right, so, so um, yeah, so, so that becomes the infant's very premature way, very, very, very limited way of interacting with reality. Okay. Which also means at this point, the infant is omnipotent. It's not omnipotent because it can do everything. It's omnipotent subjectively. Right. Meaning the infant is only gonna do like three things, right? right. Eat, poop, so and like play, right? That's, it's only gonna do those three things. Right. So a, in a normative development, the mother would, would let or facilitate those all those acts, uh, whenever the fuck the baby wants. So <laughs> within those constraints, the baby is omnipotent, mm. right. right? Right. So in other words, the mom isn't really a person, right? Right. Right. It's a extension of the baby, right? From the baby's perspective, right? At least at that point in development, because the baby just wants something. It's not like something that's that's there's a give and take. Like the baby isn't providing anything necessarily no. for the mother at this Correct. point. Correct. And even if it was, because <coughs> it's providing joy and things like that, it doesn't know that. Right. So from the baby's subjective perspective, nope, it, he is omnipotent, he or she is omnipotent, mm -hmm. right? And then the next stage of the psychic development, the psychological development, like we're not talking about neurological, I mean, there's, there's things to be talked about, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. But that, that's not the discussion right now, I'm not ignoring that. Anyway, the next step of psychic development, uh, the baby be be begins to, to understand that this is a separate person actually, but that takes time, right? It doesn't take a lot of time, you just just exposure, right? Meaning, um, this this goes into destruction. Okay. S semantic meaning psychic destruction. Okay. Meaning the baby will have been like meaning that this first stage it would have spent all that time destroying the mother, mm. right? Because the mother has, from the baby's perspective, the mother has no. Uh, thoughts and stuff like that of her own, right? Mm. Therefore, there's no such thing as a mother. Mm. For, so from a psychic standpoint, the mother is constantly being destroyed, mm. right? But the next stage, the baby begins to recognize that the mother also survives. Mm. So, the mo so, so if this is permitted to happen, the baby gains the recognition that the mother exists outside of its omnipotence. Mm. Now we're beginning to chop up reality. Right, there is a reality of what the baby can um, the, the reality that's within the baby's omnipotence, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then there's a reality outside of it. Okay, right. So, <coughs> so then this needs to be allowed to happen so that the baby can recognize that this is a separate person. Got it. <laughs> so, um, so this uh, this means this means. If this destruction and survival process is being allowed to happen, mm -hmm. then this baby, this infant, will successfully uh, obtain a clean model for the definition of other. Okay. For something other than the self. Because okay. everything within the self, you're omnipotent. Right, right. Everything outside of it, you are not. Mm -hmm. right? And as this develops, this baby gains a finer and finer and finer definition of three category of things. The omnipotence of the self or three objects, so to speak. Three internal objects. Okay. So or three internally represented things. Okay. One is um, the omnipotence of things related to the self. Mm -hmm. Second, definition of other. Mm -hmm. Third, your influence on other. Your limited influence on the on other, got it right now. If this destruction 
is not permitted to happen, which a lot of less than optimal parents would unknowingly facilitate, right? right? right. Maybe you want something, and if you're a parent that, that was reared poorly yourself, or you have some you know, extra parental stress going on, you're gonna essentially ignore the child for some reason. It may very well be a logical and sensible reason, but nevertheless, in the eyes of evolution, that's not okay. Um, that's not okay in peacetime. Yeah. Right. These things are um, um, adaptive and beneficial if you were not in peacetime. But in peacetime, that's not okay. Mostly because the child will then grow up in uh, uh, to be an adult that is not adaptive to this peaceful society. That's the only problem. <coughs> right. Anyways. So. Um, if the child is trying to manipulate you and you don't let it, the child will never develop a clean sense of the difference between the self and the other. Mm -hmm. so, then, so then the child would unknowingly, because this is the definition of reality, right? Unknowingly think of aspects of other people as aspects of himself. Right, because that's what happens in the first stage, right? Right, right, right? There's no difference right. between mom and child. Right. Mom is part of child. Right. So and if that destruction and survival th is not allowed to take place in a healthy way. You never grow out of that. Oh, that explains. Like, explain. Yeah, that, I'm like, I'm, now it, it's very clear the trajectory of how a lot of these other compensations happen. Correct, correct, correct. And this also has to do with movement, right? Because you cannot build proper brand appropriate boundaries to establish a certain task, mm. right? Because this is something we see a lot in that when you don't send something correctly, what that really means is you're not able to chop up different sensory experiences. Because now it's, you're just a steel ball and a marshmallow. Correct. It's either a steel ball or a marshmallow. It's one thing. So it's like you're either in pain or not in pain, but any right. kind of tuning Right, because you can't build boundaries. Oh, okay. That's a really foundational error, right? And once that starts, that trajectory just goes on. Because so so this is a vicious cycle that keeps on going, right? And the cycle is a is a very subtle one. Here's what I mean. Well, if you set this up, well, if you don't set it up, and, and you you come. Uh, you, you, if you come out of like the first year of your life with the lack of this survival destruction process, mm -hmm. and what that means, you spend all this time, many eternities, remember, right? No, no language, right? Mm -hmm. Many eternities thinking the boundary of the self is way bigger than it actually is. How, why would you ever question that? You have no reason to question that. And because that is your lens, you're building a lens, right? Since that is your lens, then everything you see, you will only recognize things that fit that lens. You do that for 20 years, right? We all know people are not like that. That unknowingly, naturally think things that belong to other people are inherently theirs. Right. Things like attention, things like care, that could be possessions, time. This could, and then this ties into the, this this uh, concept of entitlement that a lot of people right. have. Right. It's and not entitlement. It's not entitlement. It's this. It's this. I mean, entitlement is the word that is right. used right, by right, everyone right, else right, when right. They, they they're not aware they aren't supposed to these concepts. Right. Entitlement is the appearance. Is not mechanism. Right. 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 They don't think. Oh, your shit is not important. My shit is more important. You and mine, that doesn't exist. Right, it's all. Right. You are their left arm. Why the fuck would they think their left arm has some kind of need outside of them? Right. It's that. Right. They don't mean you any harm. They, uh, and the, the other thing is, a lot of these people are wonderful, wonderful people. Right. Except when something like, something that requires this mechanism gets brought into the fray, then there are a lot of times the perceiver like, or the victim in this situation sees the true self of, of the, the, 
really who they are, really who they are of the of the you know, victims of this. Mm. Right. I use the victim twice. Sorry, like meaning, if I'm the person that never got this destruction survival thing developed, and yeah. I just assume Joe, is, like part of Joe is just of belonging to me. Right. You would, you know, a lot of times I'm, I will be super nice, super kind, no, 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 generous, no, 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 no. And then when something that requires me to set up that boundary shows up and I don't respect that because I don't see it, right? You're gonna get this experience of like, oh, this is who you really are. Yeah. Right? It's not about real or not. Right. Right. It's just I, this is how that function will be facilitated. It's almost as if like everything is nice when there's no stress. Once load is placed on a faulty mechanism, that's when shit breaks down. Correct. Correct. So the, the other thing I, I want to add on top of this is from the perspective of the dysfunctional uh, individual, things are consistent. From your perspective, again, I'm the dysfunctional person in this example, right? From your perspective, things are all over the place. Right. Very inconsistent. Right. From my perspective, things are consistent. Right. I have this really fluid boundary of the self. Right. right. When everything's great, this is me. When things are not great, I simply expand that onto you. Mm. So from my perspective, this expansion is, I don't notice it. Right? So from my experience, it's the same thing as having the self consistently through everything. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I don't see the expansion and contraction of the self. Right? right? So when my self goes on to you and I manipulate you, so as I'm concerned, I'm manipulating the self. But yeah. So from their perspective, it's consistent. The mind is always consistent. It's its accuracy, it is its accuracy to reality that maybe you know may have discrepancies, right. but to itself, it's always consistent. Right. So. Yeah. Right. So, sin, so if you don't have this, then you lack the fundamental mechanism of chopping things up, which is what you need in order to sense stuff right so in order for this to become multiple pieces you gotta chop this up most people or a lot of people is this right right everything is going up mm -hmm. so everything under that function is one thing you don't have a arm forearm upper arm shoulder blade spine rib cage pelvis you don't have any of that is one thing right so when they lack this since they can't chop up a reality as an infant, they can't chop this up either, right? Which is also one of the reasons why, like, a lot, you know, we've seen this, in, you know, clinically, in that, like, where, where, you know, we successfully introduce somebody to the proper functional breathing mechanism, which is the easiest way to chop things up, right? Or one of, one of the easier ways to chop things up. Yeah. When they successfully do that, is a powerful, powerful emotional event. They're not sad or happy. It's just powerful, mm -hmm. right? That because it it's allowing this integration between their conscious and their their neocortex. Nope, scratch that. Nope, their conscious and their limbic system. Mm -hmm. Right, the limbic system is not producing some kind of emotion. The consciousness is simply going here. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you also you you just experience the availability or the possibility of emotions mm. but yeah so so to to refine experience right like your original like these these two bifurcations right like to experience that you will need to have better mechanisms right from a much more foundational limbic perspective right, right? because the other thing is when you are able to when you are afforded this destruction and survival mechanism, now your limbic system has a job. Okay. Right? Think about it, right? If you don't ever experience anything, sorry, scratch that. If you don't ever interact with anything other than you. Oh, oh okay, okay. I'm talking about like chair, just nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? If you're like somehow you don't need air, and you're just floating in space forever, for, and somehow that's okay, right? If some like a lot of hypotheticals, just somehow if that's okay, your limbic system would never turn on. Your limbic system exists 
for the interaction between you and others. You and others. And if you have, if you don't have the importance of this mechanism to separate and destroy, you will never have access to your limbic system. And then something that we talked about in another conversation off camera about limbic resonance. You don't have that. You don't ever have access to that. You don't need to have that. Right, because everything that you can, everything that you're trying to sense or, or to refine, you need to give the brain a good enough reason to do it. Because this is a lot of energy, right? There's a lot of resources. There's a lot of ATP. There's a lot of glucose. Right? It would need to serve a good enough reason to justify the cost. Jesus. Right. And it, the reality of the situation doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that there is, you know, close to 100 years of research telling us that without limbic resonance, you will die. Without limbic right. resonance, right. you will die early death. And if you're young enough and you get that shit cut off, you will literally die on the spot. Right, right, right. And uh, as adults, uh, limbic resonance actually facilitates health, right? Like there's a 70 year old, sorry, 70 year long, cause it's still happening, Harvard psychology study where the objective is to figure out what makes people happy, right? And there's like h tens of thousands of people being asked about this. And what they found is um, the quality of people's relationships completely predict Cancer, heart disease, and just death. But yeah, like, like, yeah. Now this is this links. It makes a lot of sense, right? Because your limbic system is not your emotions. You know, we like to think it, it, it's it's kind of like the the flat Earth versus like round Earth thing. Oh God, right? In that like, you know, because like when we're in the flat Earth like uh, um, era, uh -huh. we think um, it's a it's a Earth-centric model of the universe of the solar system, right? Like, and that everything revolves around us. Whereas in reality, no, we, we like our sun is not in the center of anything. Right. Anyways, so bringing it back to us, right? Like uh, this discussion. Um, so we we generally think that we generally think our conscious thoughts lies in the center of our mind. Okay, right. Our mind revolves around our conscious thoughts, right? I exactly. Right. In reality, the, our conscious thoughts are literally the earth. Our emotions are the sun. And reality itself is the center of the universe, or center of galaxy, right? Because this responds to this reality, and then and then our conscious thoughts revolves around emotions. But yeah, and evolutionarily it makes sense too, right? Like before conscious thought was a feature of life on Earth, emotions or limbic system was the highest function you can have, like all the mammals and stuff like that. Right. So it no shit literally gets built on top, top of, of that. emotions. Holy shit. Oh. Right. So without this, without uh, sorting this out, you cannot move better. If this is a heavy limit. Right, and like, you know, you know, some of you out there have experienced this, and like, we certainly have. In that, like, if you sort out your emotional traumas, you will move better. Yeah, right? yeah, you will absolutely move better. And it's it's not even just a little bit; it's night and it's day. It's night and day. It's difference. night and day. Difference. Night and day difference because of this mechanism. Right. And again, it's so deep in the subconscious. If you still live in live in the like conscious centric. Right, model. Because right. you can fix everything, you can attach everything. Like right, I, was, right, right. I was talking to somebody, uh, and I was relating an experience that we had, like I think about a year or two ago. Sure. And the, the experience was that you know my back started killing me, and you asked me, was like, well, what happened? And I told you that one of my friends was leaving the city. You know, spending a lot of time with this person, it was kind of like it messed me up. But my back started killing me after that. And then you were telling me, he's like, yeah, these resets are not going to help you. Yeah. You know, because that's something different. And I was actually relating that story to someone else this morning, you know, because it was like, I could see that there was just a lot of, uh, a lot of fear, a lot of like anxiety in this person. And I knew I had to get them to, to, to sense better and to understand the difference of what they perceived and what they were actually sensing. But I had to talk about that because I knew like something was telling me like, I have to talk about this because I know, well, it just hit me right now. I knew that they were going through something mm -hmm. at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I opened up a lot of my story. Sure. I related that to them, sure. and then they were like, "Thank you, like thank you for, right, for, right, for right. sharing that with me." Like, 
that was necessary for them to kind of just re right. re shift. Yeah. And I don't know how how it affected them because it was right. like I could just see that the, the thing started clicking. Yeah, you can see in the eyes in the right. facial expressions. Right. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And then that's that's when we were actually able to start to make headway with a lot of the a lot of the the movement thingies that we were doing that sure, day. Sure. Is what I tell people is like. The movement stuff that we do is really at a, at a very very low level. Very low. Like it, it's not it's not the show. No. It's yeah. the easiest access point. It's the on ramp for a lot of these things, but it's not. That's not really what we do. Yeah. There's no word for what we're doing. Uh, right. Yeah. So that's that's incredibly powerful to see how that like you're giving it a very concrete yeah, separation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and you know like uh, th that's a that's an awesome cutaway because like you were talking about like uh, you don't exactly know. What your story did for them, right, right, right. So you know, I mean, this this is a thought that I've been like entertaining recently, and you know, a lot of people, um, a lot of folks talk about mental health and like just self improvement and whatever, health, spirituality, self healing, whatever you want to you <laughs> want to label this. This, um, um, you know, they talk about a lot about acceptance, right? right. You gotta accept things. You gotta accept yourself. You gotta accept bad things that happen to you. You gotta accept that, da, 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 right? And that all sounds great, right? Except in such a nice word, right. it sounds really nice, yeah. right? I exactly. Just let's just, just the tone of it, right? Right. Except in just sounds really nice. It's really it's really hard. To, it's really difficult to have a bad negative connotation with acceptance, right? Right. It's it's like a clean positive word, right? But my theory is that. I don't think the brain slash the mind would let you accept anything you do not understand. Right, right, right. So, and, and I think a lot of people are seeing literature or whatever, or just just message being put out there that they don't say this, but the connotation is there in that you should just blindly accept things. Right. Exactly. When we put when we, when we really put the nail on there, it's absolutely that, isn't it? Right? Mm -hmm. It's like if something bad happens to you, accept it. Right. Blindly. They don't say blindly. But it's it's intimated. It's absolutely very heavily. Very heavily. Right. It's like if you I don't know, uh, lose your job. Right. You gotta accept, accept that that's happening. <laughs> accept it. And it's like I think one of the reasons why it's so fucking hard to do that in situations like that is because lack of understanding. And the other thing is, evolutionarily, why the hell would you accept something you don't understand? Right? A simple example, if a car is coming at you mm. at like 80 miles per hour, should you accept that? Get the way. You know? And <laughs> but that's because we know what a car is, right? And we know what the potential for damage could be. Like we, can right. we have references. Right. For should a three-year-old accept that? You, you know, it doesn't know what car is. So should it really accept something that it doesn't know? That makes no sense. Like we can accept for it, but it's not. Right. It needs to understand that. <sighs> okay. Yeah. Right. And it's the same. It's like, obviously, that's a really easy example, right? Let's let's bring some ambiguity into this. Okay. Right. Um, like. If you drop a knife, edge first on you, you are gonna bleed. Depending on the quality of a knife, you might be able to bleed a lot. Right, right. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, like, no shit, just like, mm, right? Uh, and most people haven't seen knives that sharp, right? And right. I'm like, they're, they're, they're out there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it would just, and get stuck, right? Uh, if, it's, if it's quality enough. And, right, it's terrible right? and, and awesome. Right, anyways. So, if you just look at a knife, Right, if you just look at a knife, and you know you, you have s some ideas like what a knife is, right? Mm -hmm. But based on this this last little caveat, some knives are really really fucking sharp, and you gotta be real careful around them. You do this, it will fucking cut your shit open. Some knives you can just like like, yeah. and you're fine. It's gonna be, you know, I've had an experience of a really really sharp knife. I remember from my from my memory, just yeah. touching the flat of the blade and slicing my finger. Absolutely. Right. I know what you're talking about. Absolutely. They sharpen that shit too. Absolutely. Right. right. Oh, that, okay. That makes more sense. All right. Continue. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway. Well, for so long. Right. So, <laughs> so without understanding that you can't really accept it. Right. Well, 
what I'm really trying to say is, if you accept it without proper understanding of it, you could die. Right. And it's like that with everything else. Understanding should be the first thing and the only thing. Acceptance is a product of understanding. understanding. If you force understanding, it's kind of like rape. Shit. Isn't it? Right? It's kind of like rape. If you force understanding. Right? And I do not use that lightly, folks. It's like, it's really like rape. Right? You are forcing something that lacks congruency. I, I would love to just throw a parallel here because you're kind of just alley ooping this for me. It's sure. kind of like if we're saying we need these positions, mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. and everyone's talking about posterior chain. Mm -hmm. like if you're forcing the position through well, strength and all of these other high threshold strategies, you are forcing that's it. an outcome yeah. rather than processing it, right. trying to understand it. Right, exactly. And from a granular, more granular perspective, like for you to for you to get that, right? You're saying just stack your spine on top of your sacrum, right? Um, if your current motor pattern does not involve that, that means your current motor pattern is actively facilitating the opposite. Mm -hmm. Right? So hip flexors are on all of them, meaning quad as well. Just quad, psoas, ili iliacus, uh, lower back, or just erectus spinae group, like QL right. potentially. All these things are are contracting to pull your lumbar spine forward, right? So if you activate these things, you mean like obliques and, and you know, internal intercostals and stuff like that, to pull it back or to push it back, without turning off those guys first, you are just doing this. You are actually forcing that, right? You're forcing something to go in a place that it, the rest of you does not want to happen, right? But yeah, it, it's, it's, it's this, this, you know, uninvited event. I like that. Right, it's I, like that, I like that. Yeah, it, it's this uninvited event. Right? Like you cannot accept something that you don't fucking understand. Yeah, you know, it's like, it's like. Go ahead, sorry. Right? It's like an asshole. It's like you know, we all got asshole friends, right? If all you know is this person's behavior, mm. right, and that um, uh, they pretend your time is less important than theirs. Um, they pretend your needs are less important than theirs, your opinion is less important than theirs. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm being really polite here, but you, I'm sure if we have examples, right? It's like, it's really infuriating, right, right? right? But if you find out that they've been abused all their lives, what? It's much easier to accept them, right? It's much easier to accept them. Or, or a more, or a <laughs> less limbically sensitive uh, example, right? <laughs> if somebody's just irritated, right? It's like you try to talk to them, they're like, get the fuck away from me, right. kind of thing, right? right? And th if that's all you know, if that's all you know, it's like, dude, this is an asshole. Right. But if later you find out there's a fucking knife sticking out of their leg, you know, you're instantly gonna be, oh my fucking God, I'm so sorry. Yeah, you yeah. have every right to be irritated. Right, right. For those of you who have never been hurt that bad, I don't know what to do for you, man. But anyways, <laughs> right? It's like if, if everybody else have incurred some kind of serious physical injury, look, we can all relate. Right, right. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but anyways, yeah, like, uh, like acceptance is not a thing. Yeah. It's just a natural byproduct of understanding. Yeah. Because then there's a there's a person on the other end, right. right? There's a person with needs on the other end, right? There's an object with circumstances on the other end. And I think it's 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 important to, to, to articulate that as well because even when you were using the example of an asshole, like mm -hmm. my initial response was like, yeah, I know a few assholes, mm -hmm. and then you brought it you brought it back in terms of like the abuse, and I said like mm -hmm. I instantly felt more empathy for this imaginary person. Exactly. It was it was instantaneous. Like I almost felt myself soften. Why? Right. As I was like, I understand that I understand the concept of trauma. Right. I understand coming back and even being the asshole on Absolutely. multiple occasions. Sure. <laughs> Right, absolutely, we all do, right? Like anybody, you know, it's like any, anybody who has come through that journey yeah. recognize, oh shit, I was, I was that at the time. But yeah. because of that, you also recognize that, you know, when, you, when you're when that hurt and you can only, you can't see it, you, you, see you it. don't mean to. It's like, nobody ever means to harm other people. Like, and, you know, that statement's a very awesome example, right? Because like, until you understood trauma, that statement of, Nobody ever means to hurt other people. Does not make sense. It could be very divisive. Right. People. Or there's something that you said once before. It's like there are no truly evil people in the world. Right. 
And then you have to deconstruct what we mean by that because if you take sure. that at face value, by you know, then you're like, well, you're wrong. What about so and so and so and so and this historical figure exactly. and this? And then you're like, yeah, yeah, but you're looking at a very small piece of the grander pie. Absolutely. Like if we're going to talk about this topic, we have to integrate this and this. What you're doing is you're looking at the steel ball. Absolutely. 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 Right? Like, you know, until you can understand what trauma can do to people. What trauma locks, what kind of perspective trauma locks people into, you really don't understand what evil is. You don't really don't understand what meanness or, or just you know, aggression and irritation and stuff like that is. Right, right. Right? Once you see that, you know, the human nature is still consistent in that we are just trying to relate positively, but not only lovingly to other people. Mm. It's just how was that mechanism curated? Where if it's curated poorly, you can fuck people up, but in your perspective, in your subjective perspective, you are not hurting other people. You are just confused as to why these people are treating you this way. But yeah. yeah. Alright folks, that's the end of the first episode. There will be more to come. Right? If you want to have discussions like this, leave a comment. Uh, we can do this uh, over distance, Skype or something like that. Um, or we can do it right here. Right? Feel free to shoot me whatever questions you have about the contents of this episode. I will see you guys later.